Today I have the simplest message that could be called a message. It's so simple, maybe I shouldn't even call it a message. It's simple, or it's simpler than simple. But I pray that you will listen so that you hear every word. The title of the message is Evidence That You Are Born Again. Can it be any simpler than that? A message like this is not for a mature church like ours. It's for a sort of beginning congregation who are now born again and now beginning to learn what it is to be born again and what it is to be a Christian. You'll find out in a little while what you thought Christianity was and who you thought was a Christian were not. But it's all because the Lord has called me to restore the truths which Satan has stolen from the church. That's the reason why I preach what I preach and in the way that I preach. I am doing the thing that the Lord has commissioned me to do. So I'm speaking to Christians today. If you believe that you have received Jesus Christ into your heart as your Savior and Lord, did you experience a greater love for Jesus Christ and God? It's a question. If you believe that you have received Jesus Christ into your heart as your Savior and Lord, did you experience a greater love for Jesus Christ and God or not? Was there any evidence that you became a new person, a new man? Was there a change in your attitude, your behavior, and your mannerism towards Jesus Christ and God and towards your fellow man? Simple questions, ABC questions, Sunday school questions. If your truthful answer is yes, then this is evidence that you have experienced the miracle of the new spiritual birth. I said truthful. If your truthful answer to these questions is yes, then you can safely say you have received the new birth because It bears the evidence. And now that you have this evidence, you can move to the next stages in becoming a Christian. We all used to think that when we said the sinner's prayer, we became Christians. But it's not so. Neither is that scripture. But we make that assumption because that is what we heard in our day, in our time, when we become, when we say the sinner's prayer, we heard that now we are a Christian. And I'm telling you today, 
That is not so, and that is not scripture. The believers in Christ were not called Christians until several things happened to them. Until they were baptized, until they were converted, until they received the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and until they received the fire of the Holy Ghost. And they went out with the message of the gospel. And the journey from Jerusalem to Antioch. And the people called them Christians to identify them as followers of Jesus. They didn't call them Christians. The word Christian came out of the words Christians. How would people know your nationality? Or when they determine that you live in Trinidad, would they call you a Jamaican? Would they call you a Mexican? What kind of can will they call you? A Trinidadian. To identify where you're from and who you are, what your culture is. So when the people of Antioch saw these believers because they were united, because they had love one for another, they had the one message, they recognized that they were followers of Jesus, of, of Jesus Christ and to identify them as followers of Jesus Christ, they said they are Christians because they belong to Christ. That happened not when they said the sinner's prayer. Okay? Now I know that's hard for you to receive because it's so far removed and so foreign from what you have heard before. What I have said so far, is it scriptural or is it not scriptural? So then why are you so depressed? <laughs> why are you so depressed? Because I quoted scripture. And I just happen to be a believer in scripture, in the word of God. And there's a reason why I am teaching this this morning, it's because Satan has robbed us of the vitality, of the integrity, of the potency of our salvation. He has, but we don't know that because if you're born into something, you're raised up into something, you become that something. But don't leave yet because I haven't even begun. So the next stages I've said before, you see, when you confess your sins, and you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, and you make him your savior and Lord, that is the only the first step or the first phase or the first stage towards becoming a Christian. So when people come to the altar, and they say the prayer, 
in recent times, we can't call it the sinner's prayer because we do not lead them as a sinner to say the prayer of repentance. That's what number one. The prayer we lead them into is a love prayer. <laughs> a love prayer that leaves out, I am a sinner and I'm going to hell or I cannot save myself. I am a sinner. I was born in sin. I was shaped in iniquity. So I am a sinner and I need Jesus to save me and I am accepting him as my sin bearer, as my savior and my Lord by virtue of him dying and taking away my sin. But we don't lead people that way anymore. We tell them how much God loves us. And regardless of how much I try to impart this, nobody listens. Why? Because I don't know what the heck I am talking about. But what it does, it really weakens and undermines the power of repentance because we have not repented. We recite a love prayer and that is not repentance. A love prayer is, will, was never a rep, repenting. And we'd look at some other things that we, I want to say innocently do, or a better word would be ignorantly do. I assume you love me, right? I just need to find out. Yeah, things we ignorantly do, that means we just don't know. The word ignorant is not really a, a hard word, a curse word, it's an informative word. It's, we don't know. So the stages after repenting of sin are these, in becoming a Christian, water baptism, conversion. You have to be converted to Jesus Christ. Then you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you have to be baptized in the fire of the Holy Spirit. Before these baptisms took place, although they accepted Jesus and they followed Jesus, all kinds of things were happening within them. They were opportunists. The disciples were opportunists. Say, Apostle, what, do you, what, what the H hell are you talking about? <laughs> Did, haven't you ever read in the Bible where they were fighting for position in the kingdom? They all wanted to be close to Jesus on his throne. They were competing with one another to f who would be the greatest. They were opportunist. They were filled with fear. They were filled with fear because when they arrested Jesus, they ran and they left him alone. <laughs> because of fear. 
and many other things. I don't want to go there because that's part of another message. All right? So I don't want to include it in this message, but just to let you know, they were still kill Kitty. <laughs> messed up. They didn't walk in the newness of life as they should have, or as we assume that they do, and we assume that we do. Jesus told them that he would be killed, but he would rise on the third day, and they should go to Galilee and wait for him. You ever read that in the Bible? Uh, where were they on the third day? Not in Galilee. They were in Jerusalem, hiding behind a bolted door with chains and locks so that the Jews can't come to arrest them and imprison them, etc., etc., etc. We're not going there today. But when they received the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire, it changed them. Completely, I leave that there. I have another message, so I don't want to bring that into this message. But they were changed and transformed. On the day of Pentecost. Because they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they were baptized in fire, and that changed and transformed those wishy-washy disciples. Today, what we have and we called <laughs> the baptism in the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to change us at all. Anybody home? That doesn't seem to change us at all. In fact, in many cases, we become worse than when we were unsaved. You see, when you begin to minimize or take away from God's word and God's truth and you twist it a little bit and you compromise it a little bit, you don't understand the danger and the damage that you do to the Christian faith and to yourself. Because it doesn't really manifest, the damage doesn't manifest itself then and there. It may manifest itself years down the road, and this is what happened to the Christian faith today. It seems as though it's powerless, but it's not powerless. Jesus did not leave or establish a, a powerless Christianity and a powerless church. But because we minimize it, we dilute it, we, we compromise it, we, we, we take out certain parts and we put in certain parts, and the whole thing begins to get weaker and weaker and weaker and less effective. And look at the result of that today. I am called by the Lord Jesus Christ to restore lost truths to the church. Those that we compromise, those that we minimize ourselves, and those that Satan has stolen from us. 
It's a big task. Because from my experience, the word goes in one ear, that comes out in another, and it's gone forever, it's lost. And we go on, we go on year after year, year after year, year after year, and we are the same place. And I came up with a, the answer to that. And I'll give it to you again. A man has not learned a thing until it has changed him. That's why we could go on year after year after year and and we are the same place. Because what, what we have or what we what we believe, what we think we know has not changed us. But it's supposed to change us. What we receive when we said the sinner's prayer, what we receive when we have water baptism, what we receive when we are baptized in the Holy Ghost, is supposed to change us. Has it changed us? I'm so glad you're honest this morning. It hasn't changed us as it is intended to. So here I am with a Sunday school message for old established congregation. And thank God you love me. Even those that have said the sinner's prayer and were baptized, if they have no evidence of the new spiritual birth, it is because they did not receive the miracle of the new birth. There must be evidence. You could jump high, you could jump low, You could believe it or not. There has to be evidence of a new spiritual birth. If it was not so, then Jesus left a big loophole in his teachings and in the gospel for us to know who is a Christian and who is not for us to know who is born again and who is not. If there's no evidence, how would anybody know who is a believer in Jesus Christ, who is saved and who is not saved? There has to be something to indicate if you have received the miracle of the new birth. It it can be left up to the wind or left up to you to decide. It can't. But today, that's how it is. People who are living the lifestyle that God says is abominable, those people are boasting that they're born again while they're living the abominable lifestyle, they say they're Christians and they're born again. Your Pope says there's no sin. Your Pope says homosexuals and lesbians are going to heaven. That's what it has become. Where is the evidence of the new life, the new man? It's not there. It's 
So even though you said the sinner's prayer, okay, let's assume you did, and that you got baptized because you put down your name and you came and you went down in the water and you came out, but you didn't feel anything different. There's no evidence in your life. And that's because I'm repeating myself. It's because you did not receive the miracle of the new birth. And so what I recommend to those people is that they take immediate and necessary steps to experience the new birth miracle. When the new birth takes place, you become very conscious of sin, and you lose the desire to sin. You lose it, it just goes. Your new desire is to know the word of God, know God and please God. When the miracle of the new birth takes place, your mind, your desires change. Because the new birth produces a sinless man. Doesn't produce a sinful man. Produces a sinless man. And he's born of the spirit of God. When I experienced the new spiritual birth on the streets of Salzburg in Austria, I had some sin appointments in different places. Guess what I did? I canceled all of them. canceled all of them. They were set up, they were well set up, everything was set. Because the desire to follow through left me. I didn't have to struggle as to whether I keep these appointments or not. The desire just left with the old man. And the new man didn't have a desire to do that, to sin. I didn't sleep last night. I went to bed at 11, hoping to get a good night's sleep so I'll be fresh for the day you know, I'll be fluent. You know, I struggle to be fluent, but I thought, well, at least if I sleep, I wouldn't struggle as much. And I just couldn't fall asleep. And at 1.15, the Lord started to chat with me. He started to fellowship with me. He took me back to Salzburg. And he told me, I should share a little of my new birth experience so that you will understand what it looks like. So I got up and I said, okay. I only share of my testimony when the Lord quickens me to do so. I do not do it as, as, a, as, as a rule because I don't want people to run into problems. Some people like to think, well, who does he think he is? See, I cause you to sin right there. I know who I am. So you asking that shows that you have a problem. 
I know who I am. The problem is, do you know who you are? And that is what you should be concerned with. Because I don't have a problem with what I experienced in God. And you shouldn't have a problem with it either. But if the Lord tells me to share a little bit, I'll share a little bit regardless of how you feel. Regardless of how you feel, why? Because there is somebody somewhere want to hear and they will respond. So for that one person, I'll disregard all of you. The Lord granted me a very unique new birth experience. Different from any other that I've heard of. Because when it happened, I had never heard the word born again. I'd never heard about the new birth. I had never heard the gospel preached. Nobody counseled me or instructed me or shared any of these things with me. But in spite of that, for all my life until then, I walked with God. I walked with God. I walk by faith. I live a life of faith, supernatural faith. We're not going to go there. You think you know a little about that. And when the Lord came to me on the streets of Salzburg, Austria, the Holy Spirit entered me. He entered me. And it felt like a glove. When you put a glove in a hand, in order for the glove to move, you have to move your hand. Let me say finger. If you want your finger to move, you would move your finger, and the glove would move with your finger. But in this experience, the glove, so to speak, the spirit, was moving me. And he was looking through my eyes, and the blink, you know your eyes blink? It wasn't me blinking. It was the Holy Ghost using my eyes to blink. I remember it distinctly. Fill all of me. And I was inside him. And the skies were bluer than I had ever seen it. The clouds were whiter than I had ever seen it. The grass appeared greener than I had ever seen it. And people were walking around me, going their business. And they could not see me because I was in a different realm. I was seeing them, I was looking at them from a different realm, a different world. And they were walking up past around me and like I was invisible to them because I was in a different realm. I was born again by the Spirit of God and I became a new man. The Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit treated me like a son.
And I said that because everything I desired, they gave to me. Everything I wanted to do, they opened the way so that I can do those things. Of course, the things that I desired to do was not to build up the flesh or to appease the flesh. My desires were to experience life and gain knowledge. I wanted to discover who I am. That's why I left my home country and went in search of discovering my purpose and my destiny. And the things that I asked for or desired was for that purpose. And they accommodated me supernaturally. I am not implying that your new birth experience must be unique. I'm not implying that. Mine was unique. And God can do that if he chooses to do that. Paul, Saul's new birth experience was unique. Nobody else experienced that but Saul. Mine was unique. Don't get vexed with me. I knew nothing about these things. I didn't ask the Lord to do these things or save me in this way or to give me this experience. I didn't ask. He chose to do that for his own purpose. And it didn't start on the street of Salzburg, Austria. It started at the age of two. And although I walked supernaturally, and in faith, supernatural faith as well, I was not yet born of the Spirit. That is a miracle in itself. I told you it was unique. We're not going to go there. It's not part of the message. You heard some of that already. But because the Lord Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit treated me like a son, and they gave me everything that I wanted by way of desire to discover myself and to discover my purpose, I was not spoiled. I was not spoiled. Their love caused me to take a humble place. You know, some people could be spoiled. Love could spoil some people. When you get everything you want from your parents, you could take them for granted. I never did. I never did it with my natural parents, and I never did it with Jesus Christ, nor God the Father, or God the Holy Spirit. So much so that I said to the Lord, I'm going to make a covenant. If ever <clears throat> I try to take the glory that belongs to you, I give you the right to take me home. Because I read in the Bible, well, even before I read it in the Bible, I made that covenant. Even before I read it in the Bible. That if I exalt myself, God will humble me. And if I humble myself, he will exalt me. I found that in the Bible later. 
You see, I, I, I acted on things that were in the Bible before I knew they were in the Bible. You know how that happened? Because I was born again by the Spirit of God. I was baptized in water. I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I was baptized in fire. And that made the difference. You know things that you didn't learn by the Spirit. That's the Christian I'm talking about. That's for the Christian. There's a phrase that's universal that I disagree with. But I've kept it to myself until now. It's the first time I would voice it. There's a phrase used in Christendom called born again Christian. There's no such thing. Man and his religion made that up. Born again Christian, what does that mean? Christians are born again. And if you're not born again, you're not a Christian. So how does, where does this born again Christian come in to Christianity? Religion, religious leaders wanting to steal what they don't have added those things. I'm a born again Christian. Really? Is that in the Bible? No. Did Jesus ever teach anything like that? No. But it's universal. If you're Christian, that means you're born of the Spirit. And if you're not born of the Spirit, you're not a Christian. So where does this born again Christian? Why do you have to born again Christian? You're a Christian. It means that you're born again by the Spirit of God. And if you were not born by the Spirit, you, you don't qualify. But again, those are some of the things we pick up along the way and we make it law. As though it's of God, as though it's in the Word of God, it's not in the Word of God. And I don't like to hear it because it, 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 it deceives the hearer, it misleads the thinker. It's not there, it's not true. But you see, these little compromises, these little additions, and these little subtractions is what damage the faith. Because we believe that is true, and it's not. When we do those things, I think Satan and the demons, they applaud us. Because they know that we are stepping off the narrow path and we are heading into the broad path. So they applaud us for doing that. Because they know in a matter of years down the road, we'll be off course. If you choose to pretend you have received the miracle of the new birth, you will remain in the hands of Satan and in the kingdom of darkness. The evidence that you're born again is a supernaturally changed life. Did anybody hear? The evidence that you're born again by the Spirit of God is a supernaturally changed life. I will repeat, you would lose the desire to sin and gain the desire to know God, please God, and to know the word of God. 
and the uniqueness of my upbringing with Christ as a boy, he gave me the desire and the hunger to know God ahead of being born again. So that hunger was there before I was born again. If after you have repented of your sins, you said the sinner's prayer, then you go out to your hallowed place to have some good worldly fun, this is evidence that you did not receive the miracle of the new birth. <laughs> okay? I see it and I hear it regularly. Especially on Olia's night. All year's night, we are used to having the biggest altar call. Because people want to change their life. They want to st stop going the way of sin, and they want to go the way of God. It's good and wonderful. So when the altar call is made, they come because they want to start the new year with a new life. But if I... I'm getting too late. Beyond 12 o'clock, everybody start looking at their watch. One guy got vexed with me because the service went on beyond 12 o'clock into 1 o'clock, but he had a party to go to, and he was vexed with me. He told me so afterwards. He said, I didn't like the fact that you cut into my time for the party. But he came and he gave his heart to Christ. But he went straight to the party. The reason why he did that, did that or rather I put, would put it this way, he had the evidence that the new birth didn't take place. That's evidence that the new birth didn't take place because if the new birth had taken place, he would forget the party and he would want to spend time with God. See, he wanted to continue with the old man. He said the sinner's prayer, but the miracle didn't take place because his heart was not in it. He wanted to live in the world and for the world, and he didn't want to give up the old life, but he said a prayer. And we assume that he was born again. Well, maybe, maybe you can't relate to that one, but how about Carnival? <laughs> you're born again by the Spirit of God. You're a new man. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, but Carnival, pardon, one that, once that pan beat, my God, something goes up in your head your blood begins to pump and you, you, you can't resist it. That's evidence. Finish it for me. I didn't say so. So don't get vexed with me. You said so. So please get vexed with the people. I didn't say so. I know that after my new birth experience, I came to Trinidad to lead my parents to Christ. And it was a carnival time. 
And I started to hear the music on the TV and so forth. I used to enjoy it. I used to enjoy listening to the music, looking at the costumes, getting into the fest even. When I was a little boy, four or five years old, I went to San Fernando from Palo Seco to spend that time with my grandmother. And it was carnival. And the band will pass in front of the house. I joined the band. <laughs> Four or five years old. Because the music is, was in my bones. <laughs> I jumped in the band. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. And when my grandmother found out that I was missing, she went crazy because she said, my father will kill her. <laughs> because as far as she's concerned, I'm lost. And I was. But God was good. She came looking for me. And a hand pulled me out of the band. <laughs> Four years old. I might have been in my mighty fall, you know. <laughs> Since you like it, let me throw in another one. <laughs> For the first time, my mother decided to take my two sisters to a community party carnival time. My parents never left us with a babysitter. We never had a babysitter. They parented the children beautifully. It was their responsibility. But my two sisters wanted to go to this community fair. So my mother decided she will go with them. So they put the children to bed, and they left. It was night time. I decided I'm going to that fair. <laughs> <laughs> They're not leaving me home, because I heard them talking and planning to go to the fair. So after they left, I woke up my brother, the one after me. I said, let's go. It's pitch black in the countryside, right? <laughs> so they're ahead of us, and we about 150 feet behind them because I don't want them to know I'm going to the fair. And at one point, my mother says, who is that behind us? <laughs> I took off. <laughs> to run back home. <laughs> Listen to my brother. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, Austin, wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> you sold me out right there. So you see, I understand the carnival spirit. It wasn't me too. So I went home and I got in the bed, cover up, they came back. I'm sound asleep. So now I'm safe. Came to visit my parents, carnival time. I hear what's going on. It was a carnival Monday. Guess what happened next? Carnival Tuesday, I was on the plane back to New York. It was gone. It was gone. That type of worldly thing was gone out of me. I couldn't stay another day. 
to hear it or be a part of it. See, God gave me a very unique experience or unique experiences so that I can teach you the difference between what is ordinary and what is divine. I would never write my life story as it could destroy you. You will see, I thought my pastor was saved. That's why anybody could come to me with any kind of sin and I will not judge them nor condemn them, but I'll know how to help them to walk out of it if they want to. Because there were times when I was sinning I shouldn't share this. And the Lord will come and stand and wait on me until I was finished to talk to me. That's not, that's not, that can't be God. That could never be God. One of those times, he waited. When I was finished, he says, go into the bathroom, I want to talk to you. And when I went and opened the bathroom, the glory of God was so powerful, I couldn't keep my eyes closed. The brightness would have blinded me. So I can't write my life story was different than you know God. I've never said that before. And it's not part of my message, so block it out. If you're not interested in keeping the new believers counseling session, that too is evidence that you have not received the miracle of the new birth. It happens a lot at the altar. People come, they say the sinner's spread, and we say there's a counselor who would like to meet with you to take you into the word of God to show you how to keep what you have received And when they ask those who repented and said, what is your name? What is your phone number? So we could keep in touch. Some of them give them a wrong name and a wrong number. That's evidence that they're not born of the Spirit. But as far as we are concerned, they came to the altar and they're saved. Far from it. We call those Christians. They're not. Because they're not interested in your Bible, in your counseling, and in your way of life. So the way they choose to deal with it is to give you a wrong name and a wrong phone number so you can't find them and they're not coming back. But we brought them, so we're happy. I brought so-and-so to church and they got saved. (laughs) And you know, we do it all the time. Somebody's in distress and you want to tell them about the Lord and they, they, they have need of prayer and you want to pray for them and, and you ask them, do you want prayer? Yes. Do you want to accept the Lord? Yes. 
So you lead them in a prayer, but they never really repented, and they, 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 don't, they don't understand any of it. And you come and you say, guess what? I led so and so to the Lord today. Yeah, but where are they going to church? Where, where, where are they? You're going to church, but they, 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 they come with you. Where, where, where are they? They can't be found. That's evidence that they did not receive the miracle of the new birth. I am not sharing this to make you feel that you're not saved or not born again. That's not the reason why I'm doing that. I want you to make it to heaven. I know how. I know how you will miss heaven. If you never show up in church services, that is further evidence that you're not born again. If you attend church services regularly, but you cannot worship the Lord, you're not interested in reading the word of God, it's further evidence that you did not receive the miracle of the new birth. And I would urge you to give your life to Jesus Christ soon. Every born again in the natural, every child, every baby that's born again in, in the natural have one thing in common, without exception. They all want to be fed. Everyone, including you. When you came out of your mother's womb, you wanted milk. Yes. Immediately you wanted milk and you let your, everybody know. You let the doctor know, your mother know, your father know, the nurse know. Everybody knew that you wanted milk. And when you're born again of the spirit, you need to be fed, just like in the natural. So when you're not reading your Bible, that is evidence that you're not born again. I know you've never heard these things before, they were never said before, but I'm commissioned to restore the things that Satan has stolen from us and weaken our position. Well, my son accepted the Lord, but he wants to watch horror movies all the time. Not interested in coming to church because God, church again. Some people who are supposed to be born again on a Sunday, aren't you going to church? Nah, well, I don't have church clothes. You ever heard that? You know why? They're not born again. Oh God, I'm losing people, <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's a joke I was making. <laughs> After I was born again, I never missed one service church. Not one. I said not one. God is hearing me. I was never late to us at service. Not once. Because my spirit wanted to be fed. Beyond me reading the Bible, I needed to be fed. 
by somebody who could teach me the word of God. I never miss one service. I was never late to one service. Because suddenly was my opportunity to be in the house of God. To hear what God has to say to me through the teacher or the preacher. And I could not afford to miss it. Nothing other than the word of God can feed and bring spiritual development to the spiritual child. Nothing. Religion and religious spirits cannot take away your sins, cannot take away your desire to sin. When you're born again, you hunger for the word of God. You're hungry to be fed food for your spirit. Now those that are born again will not oppose or resist baptism. You will, you will say you were baptized already. Some say they're baptized already as a baby. So they don't need to be baptized again. <laughs> Because they're baptized as a baby. Okay, when you were a baby, what sin did you commit? Did you repent to who? As a baby. Did you understand baptism as a baby? You knew what you were doing? No. You, you don't know any of those things. So how could you call it baptism? Well, the priest says so, so, and so. No, the priest lied. He knows nothing about the things of God. Water baptism does not save you. It's the blood of Jesus that saves, not water. Water baptism is a public declaration that you have made Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord, and you want the world to know it. And guess what? God requires it of you. Because he asks you to obey him in the first act of your new life. And if you're not willing to obey him in the first act of your new life, that means new life isn't there. <clears throat> if you want to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost as one of the things to become a Christian and to receive the baptism and fire, you have to do the following things. Let me let you in a little secret. This message today is part of your preparation because we want a new and a fresh baptism in the Holy Ghost and we want the baptism in fire. Yes. And last Monday, I encouraged those in the prayer meeting what to do to prepare for that, okay? Because I cannot baptize you in fire. So don't look to me to come and do something and then you'll be baptized in fire. It wouldn't happen. I am not the baptizer in fire. So you have to prepare to meet the baptizer in fire. 
And this message is about that. So you'll be prepared because the baptism and the Holy Ghost we have hasn't changed us. It's supposed to, but it hasn't. So we just don't want to keep, that's not working for us. And say, well, we have it. No, you don't have it. If you had it, it will transform you. It did me. I was transformed supernaturally. Strange. I was transformed on the streets of Salzburg, Austria. And when I received the baptism and the Holy Ghost, I was further transformed. And when I received the baptism and fire, my God, it cleansed me. It burned away all the trash that, that I didn't know was inside of me. And I moved to a different dimension in God. <coughs> so what do we have to do if we're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and to be baptized in fire? These are the things. One, you have to study the word of God. I didn't say read, okay? I said study. To know what the word of God is saying to you. And hide the word in your heart as much as possible. And in studying the word, you have to go further than studying the word. You have to eat the word. Now, I'm not saying physically eat. Eh? You take in the word to such a degree and in such a way that it begins to satisfy your spirit. It begins to minister to your spirit, when you study the word of God and you're born again of the spirit, it will do that. And then you have to digest the word of God. You study, you eat, <coughs> and you digest. You say, well, I've never seen in the, that in the Bible true, maybe, but that's what the Lord told me I was to do, and I did it. What I did, revelation started to come so fast. I used to ask the Lord, Lord, hold on, you're going too fast. Wait for me, wait for me, wait for me, because I was now, I was now basking in a revelation. And, he, and, and as I read the word, he's opening up the word, and I'm beginning to understand. So I'm saying, Lord, Lord, you're going too fast. Wait, 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 wait. Because I studied it, I ate it, and I digested it, kept it in my heart. The Lord told me that is what I must do, and I did. And when you do that, it will begin to change your character. It will begin to change your attitude. It will begin to change your mannerism. For the last two years, I've been trying to impart this in us, but I, I am not seeing anybody taking me on. It will change your attitude. It'll change your mannerism. It'll change your behavior. The word of God is able to do that. It has the power to do that. It's quick and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God does that. And the new man wants that. He's hungry for that. The old man couldn't care less. 
If you ask the old man, he has a Bible. If you ask to turn to Genesis, he catches none and to find it. He's looking, looking all in the back. <laughs> For Genesis. If you say turn to Revelation, he's in the middle of the book. <laughs> I'm losing plenty of people. I want <laughs> to. <laughs> the one we lost before came back. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> oh no, I shouldn't. I shouldn't talk like another one, God. <laughs> They just go into the washroom, okay? And they're, they're free to do that. But they'll be back shortly. This is how the word becomes flesh. When it begins to change your character, change your nature. And it becomes a part of your new life. Nothing else but the word can do that. So if you're not eating the word and digesting the word and making it a part of you, your nature will not be changed. Your character and your mannerism will not be changed. <clears throat> and two, you should cultivate a systematic and vibrant prayer life. Cultivate a systematic, set times that you will keep. Be systematic. Not when you feel like it. Not when it's convenient for you. Not when you finish doing all that you have to do and now you're going to go to prayer. No. Set a time to meet with Jesus. The best time is before you start working, before you get occupied with your job and your activities of the day, that first fruit, spend that quality time fellowshipping with Jesus and reading the word of God. I'll tell you what it will do. That's how you cultivate, how you cultivate a systematic prayer life. Because when you establish that time, the Lord will be there at that time waiting for you. I discover that in my meeting with the Lord because I had a set hour, set time. He told me to do that and I did it. But I was never there waiting for him. He was always at that prayer closet waiting for me. God is not impressed with lukewarm Christians. You say, how, how you know that? I never read that in the Bible. I have. He said, I'll spit you. If you're lukewarm, he said, I'll spit you out of the mouth. That tells me he's not impressed. If he will spit you out of his mouth, don't tell me that he's impressed with you. And when he spit you out, an angel is waiting to take you to heaven. Don't think so, you know. Angel not waiting to take you to heaven. An, an angel from the dark world <laughs> is waiting for you. When he spit you out, because you look warm. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. 
I could tell by the way you look that you, 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 you want to get vexed with me, but I didn't say that. <laughs> so I have to jump in quick and save myself. And you must increase your love for Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit every day until you are in a divine love and romantic relationship with them. When you do that, you're a candidate to receive the baptism in fire. I knew nothing about this. I heard no one talk about this. I didn't even know it was in the Bible, but it happened to me. Because I did the things I just told you that I want you to do. My teacher was Jesus. He used to tell me, instruct me, what to do and how to do it. Because no preacher was telling you what I just told you. It all came from him. And it was my habit to end my day worshiping him. And that's all I was doing. Loving him and worshiping him. When from in the heavens, a world with a fire headed my way, came through the ceiling, landed on my head, and burned it in its way inside of my head. And there was a pool of fire. I was all around me like a swimming pool of fire, burning away chaff, debris, trash from inside of me. It's for the Christian. It's for the believer. So you could have a clean heart. A pure heart. And after three baptisms, I questioned God, Lord, the first two baptisms, the first one burned all the chaff. The second one, there was some chaff. Where, where did it come from? A surprise. It was burnt out. And then when the third baptism took place, there was still a little trash. Lord, I asked the Lord, where, where, I mean, I know I'm not sinning, right? I must know. We must know if we're in sin or not. I know I'm not in sin. I know I'm walking according to the word of God. And the Lord answered me, he says, the things that you see in the world, the things that you hear in the world, it has a way of leaving trash. It comes through your eyes, it comes through your ears. That's why he says, be ye separate. That's why you can't be one foot in and one foot out. You have to have both feet in if you want the fullness of the baptism. Three baptisms and some people can't even get one. And guess what? I am now in line for another one. I want a new, real, fresh baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. I want it. If you don't want it, that's fine. But I want it. I know how to get it. And I want you to have it as well. That's why I'm teaching you on this. It'll cost you quality time 
in the word, in prayer, and with Jesus and with the Father. If you're too busy for them, you're not ready. It's not going to happen. Let me prove that to you. I will come in for a landing shortly, but I have to prove this to you first. Go with me to the book of John. I know you never read where we go in. I know I never preached to you on this before. John 14. Let's go to verse 15. You've heard this a million times, but you didn't hear it. So I'm going to give it to you again, this time. Verse 15. Jesus is leaving his disciples and he's going back to the Father. They're sad, they're depressed, because they'll have to face the Jews and the Romans all by themselves without Jesus. But Jesus knew that he is not going to leave them as an orphan, as orphans. He said, so I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. He will, he will do something about it. But he says, if you love me, if you love me, You've heard those words from me a million times. You have read the scripture two million times. But look at it today with new eyes and a new spirit. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my word. That is commandments. And when I see that you love me because you're keeping my word and you're doing my word, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you in my place forever. And he says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, that's revealing. If you're worldly, even though you call yourself a Christian, but you're worldly, he said you cannot receive him. I'm stressing this because we skip over all these things and we tell everybody they're saved and they're going to heaven. And we tell everybody, yeah, that thing you're saying, that strange language you're speaking, that's the Holy Ghost, that's, in the Spirit. that's what we tell the people and they believe it. But that language you have, did it come out of your love for Jesus? He says, you have to love me. You have to keep my word. And when I see that you Keeping my word, that's how I know that you love me. And then he says, I will ask the Father to send you another comforter in my place. And he will abide with you forever. He says the world cannot receive him, the comforter, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. That word comfortless means an orphan. I would not leave you as an orphan. You need your spiritual father. You need your, your savior. And you need the spirit of God. He's not coming for those that's worldly. 
yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. I would like to do a, a verse-by-verse Bible study on, on, on these things. It will take a while, but um, we have a better teacher than I am, so we let the teacher do it. But, 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 but one of these days, I would love to do it because these things are potent and they are powerful. They're, 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 they're deeper than we see on the surface. Much deeper than we see on the surface. He says, in that day, the day when the comforter comes, ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. That will build your confidence in God. So when you have to pray for the sick, You were able to pray from a position of knowing. (coughs) It is, you are not the healer, but the one that's inside of you. The Father is inside of you. Jesus is inside of you. The Holy Ghost is inside of you. (coughs) At that day, ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Jesus is bringing it again from another angle. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, my God, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. I would love him. He has proven that he loves me. And I would love him back. But you have to prove that you love me for all of this to happen. And I will manifest myself to him. When I would go into my prayer closet, to meet with Jesus, he would begin to open my spiritual eyes. To show me things to come tomorrow, next week, next weekend, the things he wanted me to do. Where, when, and how. I loved him. I loved him. I loved him with passion. I still do. I always will with passion. It's my life. Once you taste the romance of God, You cannot live without it. Once you taste the sweetness of Christ and the Father and the Holy Ghost, you cannot live without it. It's not like a human love. It goes beyond. It's pure. It's holy. It's clean. It's powerful. But we read these words, if you love me, and we don't know what it means. We think it's saying, Jesus, I love you. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. No, it's not that. It's a divine romance that you can't live without. Because you have already tasted the word. The word brings you to that place. It sweetens you on the inside. It sweetens you on the inside. Oh, we read the Bible and we say we read the Bible. 
You didn't read any Bible because it didn't change you. What you read didn't change you. What I read, I allowed it to change me because I did what it said. So when people hated me, it drew me closer into the bosom of the Father and into the arms of Jesus. I did not, I don't ever respond because they don't know who they are and what they're doing. I know who I am and I know how to be victorious. I know how to conquer them by doing what the word says. And so I realized I don't have any enemies. These were people that Satan was using, but God was using them to keep me in his arms. I'm doing the word. Love your enemies. Love those that hate you and despitefully use you. You have to do it as a Christian. You have to do it to prove to Jesus that you love him. And if you don't do it, he knows that you don't love him. So the Holy Ghost is not coming for you. So you have to settle for a different ghost. I will transform you, change you. What verse are we in now? <laughs> oh yes, he says, yes, a little while and the world see at me no more, but he see me because I live. <laughs> He said, you shall live also, hallelujah. Because I live, you would live. Well, there's a verse of scripture that, 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 that does wonders for me. Jesus says, when I make you my friend, he says, when I make you my friend, Everything that I see the Father is doing, I'll make it known to you because you're my friend. My God. Could you imagine that Jesus, all the Father's secrets, because you, he has made you his friend, he will come and share it with you. It's for the Christian. It all starts with loving him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But we didn't learn that. Because if we had learned it, it would change us. A man has not learned a thing until it has changed him. If you find us saying it too much, that's your problem. (laughs) I need to say it. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Oh, we read that already. Judas said unto him, not Judas Iscariot, another one, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself to us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, what did he say? Jesus Christ. Again? (laughs) He 
You see how many times he brought it in, if you love me. <clears throat> if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. All three coming was Jesus sees that you love him. He says the Holy Ghost is coming. I come in too. Trinidad talk. I come in too. And he said the Father come in too. All three of us come in. Could, could you handle that? Could you handle the Trinity living inside of you? So I don't know why we struggle with things. If you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost living inside of you, I don't know why you struggle the way that you do. It's a mystery to me. Why are you worrying with little dolly house things? And the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost living inside, and you worry? Do, do they tell you to worry? They're inside of you now, so you have a little situation that's a little off. Do they tell you, now the time to worry? So you worry. So stop worrying. Know who is inside of you. Know what happened to you on the day of your Pentecost. Know what happened when the fire came into you and burned up the dross. <coughs> know what happened. Because you're living there. The world has become flesh, so you're there. He that loveth me and keepeth my words, which ye hear, the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall do what? Teach you all things. And not only that, he will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. I wonder if you know what you just read. I wonder if you know what you just read. That's what you're missing out on. Because you thought loving Jesus was this little surface thing you say with your defiled lips. Lord, I love you. And you cry some crocodile tears so he can feel sorry for you and bless you. That's why we cry, you know. To show the Lord how, how, how needy we are. We cry to show him how needy we are. So he, needy we are so he'll feel sorry for us. And he doesn't. Because he knows that there are crocodile tears. A crocodile could cry at will any time. <clears throat> Just decide to let some tears come out, and we do the same thing. <laughs> we do the same thing. <laughs> if every time you go before God and you cried, he used to give you what you want, you will be blessed in every way. 
But all he says is, cry on, my child. Let out some tears. You have too much. So release some. <laughs> and when you finish releasing them, do what I say in my word and love me. <clears throat> now, I want you to study, eat, and digest chapter 14, John chapter 14. And when you, when you get it all in, I want you to go to chapter 15. And everything you see in chapter 15, eat and digest and make it a part of your nature and your character. And you will see how easy it will be for Jesus and the Holy Ghost to come to you in that glorious day. That's your home lesson. God requires the body of the Christian to become the temple for the Holy Spirit to live in and work through. Know that. That, that body of yours, he wants that body to become the temple for the Holy Ghost to live in and work through. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is grieved if we sin. He becomes dormant in us if we grieve him. He's there, but he becomes dormant, and if you continue to grieve him, he'll just step out. Most Christians do not give him the attention he deserves. But those who do, <clears throat> and those who become intimate with him, would come under the divine covering and the divine protection of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So the more of the word of God we have in us, the more the Holy Spirit will avail himself to us and work through us. I have two scriptures and I end. John chapter 6, verse 63. says it is the spirit <clears throat> that quickened that word means give life it is the spirit that gives life the flesh profited nothing the words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life Eat the word, digest the word, make it a part of you. Let it change your nature, let it change your character, it'll change your mannerism. It will squeeze out bad habits and replace it with godly habits. It'll change your mind. I have one more scripture, First John. <clears throat> J 
chapter 2. <clears throat> Reading from verse 18. Little children, <clears throat> it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. <clears throat> they went out from us, but they were not of us. They went out from us, <clears throat> but they were not of us. So don't fret yourself when they go. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt have con continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Full of revelation in those verses. But ye... <clears throat> have an unction from the Holy One. You have an anointing. Unction is anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. That anointing will cause you to know things that you were not taught. Things that you never heard before. So you need the Holy Ghost yes. to give you that anointing. It starts with loving Jesus and being filled with the Holy Ghost and then being baptized with fire. That's when you get this unction, this anointing, this special anointing that teaches you all things. And you can read the rest of it when you go home. That anointing is what taught me everything that I know. <clears throat> I, w I, was, I was given a doctorate in divinity, another one and another one. And the time came when <clears throat> I wasn't content just to have honorary doctorates. So rather than go to a university, a theological seminary, because I am in ministry, proven ministry, and I've done a lot of things that all summed up to, well, okay, I could just write a thesis rather than spending time to go to a classroom. I said, great, wonderful, I like that. So I wrote a thesis. And the thesis was on know the truth. And that series I did, know the truth. So I put it together in that required form, and I submitted it, I got an A plus. <clears throat> an A plus. Where did I get this knowledge? without going to a classroom. The unction, 
the anointing that the Holy Ghost gives to you, it teaches you all things. That anointing is precious. If I begin to tell you what that anointing does, and if I begin to put it in the form of a testimony, you will surely see a boasting. And you might be right. I have good reason to boast. <laughs> it's my testimony, Amen. not yours, so you can't stop me from saying what the Holy Ghost did for me and in me. You're fast. <laughs> it's my testimony. Yes. I paid the price yes. to do what the Word says, yes. to love him as he asked me to love him. God asked you to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you refused to do it. So what's, why are you vexed? Because I have it. I love him. With all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you can have the same anointing if you would begin to love him as he demands it. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. And he said, don't forget to love your neighbor too. It's true I'm poor because I give my neighbor all my, all my money. Who is your neighbor? The person next to you at the time. That's your neighbor. You thought it was the lady who built a house. <laughs> you, that alone. No, 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 no. The person next to you at every given time. That's your neighbor. If I show you how empty my pocket is, you'll surely give me some money to go home. I had too many neighbors, but I had too many neighbors. <laughs> And I discovered something about God. God's number one business is people. Not the stock market. Not playway. It's people. And if you want to invest in something that is sure, invest in people. Help, who you can help to discover their purpose and fulfill it. That's what I've been doing all my life. And for that reason, I have no money. But that's okay. My father has the money. <laughs> he owns the gold and the silver. And he owns the cattle and all the hills. And I don't have to worry. As he provides whatever I need, whenever I need it. And the Bible says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. I'm finished with my message, but just to remind you, the day you hear me beg for money to run this ministry, you know what happened to me, right? What happened to me? I've gone mad. <laughs> <laughs> so call the ambulance. Take me straight to the mental institution. Two things happened to me. I've gone mad or God has finished with me. 
So, but when you get to know him, when you get to know him, when you become intimate with him, and you taste him, you taste the heavenly gift, you taste that heavenly life, no weapon that's formed against you will prosper because you have to go through God because you, you're in his bosom. You're in his bosom. The enemy has to come there to get you and he can't because that's your home. You don't have to retaliate. You don't have to quarrel. You don't have to fight. He fight for you. He will see you through. We sing it in a song, but it's just a song. But it's real. And so if you want to overthrow me, change your mind. Because you will be overthrown. If you dig in a pit for me to fall in, I know I, I'm not falling in that pit. I know you are going to fall in that pit. And I just want to say what, can I say one, one more thing? Just one more thing. When people come to you with gossip, Stop entertaining them. Because when you entertain them, you partake of their sin. I want you to know that. You want to hear. Because there's something inside of you that wants you to be a part of the catastrophe. You can't stay out. You just want to be a part. I want you to know you are partaking of that person's sin. Just as if you have devised it yourself. Tell them you don't want to hear. Because whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things of would think on these things. So if they're not doing those things, yeah. run for your life. Because Satan is trying to set you up yeah. and you don't realize it. You think it's somebody yes. when you're the victim. Finish. I want you to fall in love with him. And after I see evidence that you love him, then we will deal, have another day of Pentecost. We'll have a day of Pentecost. Because we all need a fresh baptism in the Holy Ghost. And we need to be baptized in fire. Love him. Love him.
how you will prove to Jesus that you love him and then he'll send the Holy Ghost for you you must have evidence of love wow it's so easy it's so easy It is so easy to do what God asks us to do in his word. But we make it difficult. You know why? We cannot leave that old man out. We cannot give up that old man. When somebody says something about us, we call on the old man. Does the old man know exactly how to get even? You don't have to get even. The new man doesn't have to get even. It's only the old man wants to get even, not the new man. He exists above. He exists above the old man. Is that too hard for us? time we change. 
It's time we allow the word and the spirit to change us. You can't change yourself. How long? How long? an intercessor, I did not ask you to come. line of the battles in this church. 
these are the ones, Lord Jesus, who deny themselves and make themselves available to come to fight the forces of darkness that want to come into this church to rob the people of their salvation, to cause them to be cold and indifferent so that you can spit them out of your mouth. And I believe, Lord Jesus, they deserve the first fruit of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. So right now, I release, I release the Holy Spirit upon you now in the name of Jesus. I release the Holy Spirit right now to give you a new and a fresh baptism in the name of Jesus. Receive the Holy Spirit now. Receive the Lord Jesus now. Receive him now in the name of Jesus. Congregation, you should be praying, not spectating. In the name of Jesus, congregation, you should be praying, not spectating. Let the Spirit of God move. Let the Spirit of God breathe today. Breathe upon them today, Holy Spirit. They need a greater unction of the Spirit. For a greater unction of the Spirit. For a greater unction of the Spirit.
for the intercessors the next time you go to pray and you pray in the spirit your, your tongues will be different you'll have a new tongue a different tongue I'm not saying anything was wrong with the tongue that you had before but there's a time for refreshing the times for renewing and that is what the new tongues will do and bring for you just flow with it just flow with that new endowment of the spirit it will take you higher it will take you deeper than you went before this is just a prelude of when we get to loving the Lord the way I spoke about it this morning. When that time comes, it'll take us deeper. You may go back to your seat. If you're at the altar and you're not ready to go back, just wait, just stay there. Just stay there until you're ready to go back.
if the Spirit of God is working with her, leave her there. Introducing the Know the Truth series by Dr. Austin DeBoog. It will open your eyes to God's truth on four misunderstood and misrepresented Christian teachings. Saints. Conferring sainthood upon dead people contradicts God's word. Communion. Infinitely more than a mundane ritualistic tradition. The Church. God's church is not a man-made religion. And praying versus saying prayers. Praying as Jesus taught is not just reciting someone else's words. If you think wrong, you will believe wrong. 
and you will act wrong. Too many of us are accepting wrong Christian beliefs. This blinds us to the truth of God's infallible word and robs us of God's abundant blessings. This book series challenges you to take a closer look at what you've been taught. It will revolutionize your thinking. It is time to know the truth. Help me know. 